everyone. Welcome back to Impact Media. Uh, today, my guest is Solomon Goldstein Rose, and he's been a climate activist since age 11. He studied engineering and public policy and interned in the Obama White House and in Congress. And he was also elected to the Massachusetts legislature at age 22. And then he left to work full time on climate change at the national and global levels. And so he joins us today to talk about how the United States could single handedly solve most of the current climate crisis just with infrastructure changes and not necessarily lifestyle ones. And he outlines this in a detailed plan in his new book, The 100 percent Solution, A Plan for Solving Climate Change. So I'm so glad he joined us today. So Solomon, welcome. How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. And I'm really excited to talk with you uh, about this. Um, so first, can you just give me an overview of uh, why did you create this book and what is, the, what is the basic of the book about? The book came from me trying to wrap my own mind around the comprehensive picture of climate change. Where do all emissions come from and what physically needs to be accomplished to eliminate emissions? And that's what the book lays out, basically. What physically has to be accomplished, I lay out five different pillars of the, the transition and the innovation we need to get there. And so let's let's talk about those those pillars really quickly. Can you tell us what are the five pillars that you that you outline? Yeah, first is electricity generation. That's what a lot of people think of. We need to replace all our dirty power plants with clean options. And we're going to need a lot more than our current generation capacity because we need to use more electricity than we do now for the second pillar, which is electrification, uh, running electric cars, changing home heating to electric if it's not already, that kind of thing. And then there's a third pillar, which is synthesized fuels. And these might be synthesized from electricity, but there are some applications like airplanes that are still going to need fuels. They need the energy density of a liquid fuel. Um, and that's not gonna change by 2050 when we need to get to net zero emissions. So that's the third pillar, also relying on electricity. The fourth pillar is non-energy shifts. There are a number of things in agriculture and some industrial processes that need to be changed. Um, farming practices, different technologies in industry. Um, actually, a third of emissions or more come from non-energy processes, not burning fossil fuels, but something else. And then the fifth pillar is sequestration, because it's not enough to get to net zero emissions. Um, but well, one, to get to net zero, we're not gonna be able to eliminate 100% of emissions. So we need to pull CO2 from the atmosphere to get to net zero, but we need to go further into net negative emissions to draw down the levels of CO2 in the atmosphere so that we eventually get back to normal temperatures and, and stop and reverse warming. Okay, and so I noticed that, you know, a, a lot of that in there, it, it seems like you're changing, you know, infrastructure or equipment. So. It, will people actually have to make lifestyle changes in order to make these pillars come to fruition? Yeah, that's a key point of my book is that basically we need to think of it as an engineering problem. It's not simply a political choice, thou shalt decarbonize and it magically happens. It needs to be practical. Two thirds of emissions come from developing countries. They can't afford to pay any extra for clean options. So that means we need to make clean options cheaper than dirty options. And that means that we're not gonna have to pay any extra for them. Um, it's not going to limit the amount of energy people can use. It's going to be cheaper energy, in fact, because we have to make it cheaper if it's going to scale fast enough. And so people think that climate action might mean they have to limit their lifestyles. In fact, it's almost the opposite. Um, you can drive as much as you want, but it's gonna be an electric car. And so your maintenance costs are gonna be less, that kind of thing. Um, there are some cases like it would be nice if people ate less beef. There are ways that we can use policy and engineering to get around the emissions from beef, even if people are eating it. But there are some things that we should encourage behavior change. By and large, though, the solution will come from changing equipment, not lifestyles. So like in, you know, obviously it, a lot of us are familiar with the um, environmental cost of making beef. But you, here you're saying even if the current lifestyle that we have right now in the U.S. was maintained, people are still consuming at the levels they're consuming. Mm -hmm you're still saying this can be done um, just by simply changing the infrastructure, you know, uh, electric cars and lots of the other uh, electric generation that you've talked about. Um, but I'm curious if, if climate change is a global problem, then how can just us, how can just the U.S. 
make this happen? How can we help solve this if, if it's really the entire world that's, that's contributing to it? This is the brilliance of it, because the U.S. is only 10 or 15 percent of emissions, but we're the world's innovator. We create a lot of the new technologies that eventually spread throughout the world, and we would like to be manufacturing more than we are. Um, and so you combine those two, and you can see we're poised to scale up the clean technologies we need. Think about how expensive electric cars are, the upfront cost versus the upfront cost of a gas car. It's because how many electric cars have we ever manufactured in history versus how many gas cars have we ever manufactured in history? As soon as we massively scale up electric car manufacturing, the capital costs will come down on par with gas cars, and they're so much cheaper to operate over time, everyone will switch to electric cars simply because they are cheaper, safer, healthier, um, but mostly cheaper. That's what's going to make them spread throughout the world. We can do that scale up in the US and then export these technologies around the world, creating a manufacturing boom at home and cheaper energy around the world. And um, I guess in that pioneering effort, the, the simple fact of just scaling up that manufacturing here, um, does, that, does that put pressure on other nations to follow suit uh, for economic reasons? Well, certainly a lot of things that the U.S. has invented at some point and started manufacturing, China will come along and manufacture it cheaper eventually and get it to an even larger scale. And that's great. Um, as long as we make a commitment to be on the leading edge of the innovation, which we're not necessarily right now with a lot of clean technologies, but we easily could be because a lot of the basic science is still in U.S. academic institutions and such. If we're always manufacturing the first five or 10 years worth of the next thing and the next thing, um, that's a sustainable model that that's great for us and the world. I have a specific question about that. Yeah. So, you know, because... As you know, the Biden administration just made the climate crisis like a number one priority. And in, in, I hear you say that you that we're currently not, um, at least it doesn't look like we've committed to scaling up that infrastructure production. Can you tell me specifically how we aren't and how we could? Like, what what does it look like if we actually start to do it? Yeah, well, one great example is something that Biden has said he wants to do, which is use the purchasing power of the federal government to create an initial market for large numbers of electric vehicles. That's an example where if the federal government, and all told, I think it's something like 3 million vehicles across all different government entities. And if the federal government led an effort to replace all of those over five or 10 years with electric vehicles, that would drive significant manufacturing to create that, that first entry into market for truly mass manufactured EVs. Um, doing that kind of thing across a range of technology. Sometimes it's early demonstration. The US needs to be funding a lot more first of a kind demonstration of a, a new st steel making plant or that kind of thing um, so that people see it works and then you can put in mass production for something like EVs. It's just scale up the manufacturing. Right, and you're saying it, it could be accomplished in five to 10 years, uh, basically. Absolutely, and we need it to be because we need to get to the scale that the capital costs have come down enough that the clean option is the definitively cheaper option. Because from that point, it's going to take a while. You're not going to replace your gas car with a new electric car when your gas car is still operating fine. You're going to wait until you would buy a new car anyway. And then the cheaper option is going to be electric and you're going to buy an electric car. But that's, you know, people tend to use cars for 15 years or so. So you need to make the electric cars cheaper at least 15 years before we want to be totally decarbonized. And that deadline is 2050. So we need to be doing this work in the next five or 10 years so that 10, 15 years from now, all the clean options are cheaper. Got it. And that was actually going to be my next question to you. I was going to ask, like, how quickly do we need this to happen? And so you're saying that um, it, you're saying by 2050, this all needs to have have been accomplished. But as we know, like it, it takes an initial upfront effort of like a 10 year, 15 year period. So um, can you spell out for the audience, not just the timeline of the goal, because obviously 2050, but what needs to happen in the next couple decades in order for that to happen. And you mentioned the example of EVs, but what about the infrastructure? What about power plants? How long realistically is that going to take or how quickly could we make those kinds of infrastructure changes happen? Yeah, power plants tend to last 30, sometimes 50 years or more. So there are power plants that are old that will be retired. And same thing if we have solar, wind, nuclear, geothermal, hydro that are cheaper, we can be replacing you know, what otherwise would be built as new fossil power plants with new clean plants. We will also need to retire 
especially a lot of countries have recently been building coal plants, India, China. Um, we need programs to retire those coal plants early. And that is more likely to happen once the clean options get so cheap that you can see the economics working maybe with a little policy intervention to retire a coal plant, build a new clean plant with all the capital cost and still save money because you don't have to pay for the fuel cost of the coal. And so um, looking at those, looking at these energy generation options that are just rapidly decreasing in price, like solar, which among them, which chief among them do you see being most instrumental? Obviously all of them are, but which one is kind of like leading the charge, so to speak? Well, we need all of them, definitely. Um, solar is the, the absolute cheapest, but it only works during the daytime and it doesn't work during week-long periods where it's really cloudy. Um, batteries are not going to ever get to the point that they can do the seasonal storage summer into winter to account for the change in solar in northern areas where there's a big seasonal change. So solar has a big role to play, but it can't do everything itself. If you combine it with wind, it gets better. The one that I think it doesn't get enough attention is nuclear. Uh, even the word scares a lot of people, but actually statistically, it's the safest source of energy that we have. And it's baseload. It can run 24 seven, no carbon output, and takes up way less land area than solar and wind. And that means that if, if we committed to mass production to lower the cost of nuclear, we could add a lot more clean generation faster than if we didn't include it in the mix. And um, so I wanna talk about like the, the uh, economic benefits of this um, and like the job creation. A lot of people are worried about disappearing jobs and you know people that are gonna have to be retrained and some people that will actually not be able to be retrained because their specialty is too context specific and the skills aren't transferable. Um, can you talk about like what kind of an opportunity are we looking at here to kind of reshape our job market and our economy. Um, and with such a rapid transition, aid us in building up a more a robust economy and stable middle class. Absolutely. I think the Sunrise Movement has done a great job framing climate action in terms of the you know, Green New Deal type thinking that, that scaling up the equipment we need equals job creation. And it really does. Um, the, the build out of the new infrastructure will create millions of jobs and the countries that act first and boldest on it will reap the most benefits in terms of job creation. There is another side though. It's gonna create many more jobs than, than it removes, but for the people who do lose their jobs in fossil fuel industries, not all of them, as you say, can necessarily transition. So I actually thought the Biden plan was pretty good on this, it, taking into account the, you know, the number of jobs that would go away, even if the entire fossil fuel industry disappeared overnight, is less than the number from specific programs Biden has already proposed that would create new jobs. But he said, we're going to guarantee the pensions and do um, you know, retraining for some people and early retirement payments where necessary for people who it is not practical to switch into a clean energy job. So you do need to consider the fossil fuel workers, but for society as a whole, it, it's a, a big net benefit. And it's also, uh, it appears to be a benefit to many, many nations uh, across the world, especially in giving people energy access. So I wanna ask you, um, in this 100% solution, how does this help create more energy access and how does that affect um, the average lifestyle and quality of life of people across the world? That's a great question. So remember I said the US can take the lead in scaling up doing so, some invention, mostly mass manufacturing things to bring down their capital costs. That's necessary because developing countries such as India, for example, need the, the cheapest option because people are just getting reliable access to energy. So we need to bring the cost of clean energy below the current cost of fossil energy. That means we've brought the cost of energy below the current cost of energy. And that means that more people will be able to afford to have access to energy reliably. And that will accelerate all of the reduction in poverty. You know, access to energy is one of the main drivers of economic development in poor countries that are now middle income countries and using, and that's, it's what's driving most of the emissions increase right now. It's not population growth, it's current people getting new access to energy. We want that to accelerate. It just has to be clean energy and that's how, why we have to make it cheaper. But 
in making it cheaper, we will actually accelerate that process of eliminating poverty. All right. And is there any other like key points in this climate solution that we haven't covered yet that that you want to that you want to pinpoint? Because um, I, I just want to make sure I'm getting all of the information about it as possible. Yeah. One thing is the role of individual people that people often think that we, we should be thinking about our personal responsibility, our carbon footprint. And I try to push back on that, that it is a collective problem. We are not individually guilty for using a gas car because many of us can't afford an electric car. Uh, I'm in an apartment. I have nowhere to charge an electric car at home. It just literally doesn't work. So we don't need to feel personally responsible for having a, a totally net zero emissions lifestyle ourselves, that's impossible. What we need to feel responsible for is being part of the political activism, voting, donating, spreading the word on social media to get political leaders and business leaders thinking about the solutions that we need, the collective action that we need that will actually address the full scope of the problem. Right. And that's kind of like the, the one of the things about this that um, concerns me is a lot. A lot is that if people feel like they can't, well, I can't afford an electric car, and I can't. Um, it all I have is just my one vote. Um, some people they seem to get really depressed and like bogged down because they feel like they're they're you know butting up against a wall. And other than voting and in policy actions, um, what other things have you found that encourage people to to get involved? What other than the things that you've described? Is there anything yeah. else that you want people to to remember? In this, in this battle to, to solve this problem? I think that communications is key. Communications is everything in politics, but communicating a clear vision of not only, no, this is equipment change, not lifestyle change, but also this is possible. If we do these steps at the, the government level and the large company level, then we will solve the problem. I think a lot of activists are, are cynical because they've had struggles to get the political change that they want in past movements. Mm -hmm. And uh, having that cynicism sometimes even deters people from being engaged. So knowing that it's possible, I think not only encourages activists to recommit, but encourages people who are not activists and are even wary of climate change to support it because they see, oh, okay, one, it's not going to limit my lifestyle. This is good economically. And two, for this political action that may still seem daunting, you know, large government action will actually solve the problem. And you can see the benefit of that. Right. And some people like it, and everything you just said, a hundred percent agree. Some people might look at this and they might think, well, that's possible, but is it probable? Like, is that likely? And I want to see from you and see if you can uh, opinionate on this. Like, obviously we have a new administration now and, and, and like, like I mentioned before, they're prioritizing it. Can you see a roadmap to that happening with this administration in, in the next 10 years? Do you, do you personally feel like that's likely? And, and, and even if uh, maybe it's hard to make a comment on that, how, how could that happen with the current federal government that we now have? Yeah. So I think, although I emphasize the U.S. could single-handedly solve climate change, I don't think we will. I think that the U.S. will do a lot more that's good under the Biden administration. I think the Sunrise Movement has done an excellent job of pushing climate change to the top of the agenda and will continue to do so and continue to push for more ambitious action. And, and that will be good. I'm not overly hopeful that the U.S. will do everything that it ideally should in, in the next four years. I think that the U.S. will do some good. And, and for instance, electric cars is something that the, the current administration seems very committed to. Um, other things might be done through European leadership. Europe has said they're going to focus their COVID recovery a lot on clean energy rollout. And they're focusing on hydrogen, for example, which is a piece that the U.S. might work on, but not as front and center. Um, other countries may take on different pieces like agriculture. So, and, the, and then there are companies and, and individual investors, and there's a lot more energy shifting into the, the clean tech space and the nonprofit work on agriculture and such. So I am very optimistic at the moment, but I, I can't say there's one course that's just going to happen in the next few years. Well, that, well that, that's important to highlight, though, is that is that, you know, it's not necessarily... You, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're saying it's not necessarily incumbent on us to solve the problem, but we could, but that there's also other avenues to which this could happen, even if we fail to do everything we should be doing in the next four years. Is that what you're saying here? Yeah, and I mean, it, 
we should think of it as incumbent on us. The U.S. is the richest country in the world, the largest economy. We should be the ones innovating everything and it would benefit us. But as citizens in the U.S., we can vote and we can be activists, but we can also pressure companies. And that's a different route. And there are a lot of other avenues, if you will, hedging our bets that we should pressure the federal government to do as much as we can. But there are also state governments. There are big cities and there are big companies and all of those can decide to, for instance, convert buildings to all electric air source heat pumps for heating. Um, that will scale up the, some of the equipment that we need to scale up and make cheaper. And some companies are getting into it. Some are still doing the greenwashing, but more and more there's some actual engineering thinking and honest accounting. And we need to encourage that and push for that to accelerate as well. And um, can you, can you like mention, I don't want to point any fingers at anybody, but maybe, um, maybe we should, can you mention any companies where you're, where you're like seeing like, okay, maybe we should be pressuring this organization to do more or, or are there any companies where you're like, where you're seeing those seeds of change really start to, to come to fruition that you think will have a domino effect? Yeah. So one company I think did a really good thing is Stripe. They made a commitment to spend at least a million dollars a year on carbon sequestration. And they laid out their methodology. It was very scientifically accurate, very technical. They analyzed several companies and they said, this is about investing early on to enable these companies to demonstrate their technology and even in some cases develop their technologies. So they're, they're paying very high prices for tons of CO2 removed from the atmosphere to enable technologies. And that price will come down as the things scale up. We need more of that kind of thinking. Um, and I think several other companies are starting to go in that direction as well. Uh, obviously, one company I'd love to see do much more is Amazon. They have theoretically commitments to being cleaner and, and getting to uh, net zero or whatever, but the, they could decide to convert their entire shipping fleet of, of freight trucks largely to electric or to hydrogen. Um, and things like that, that, that would have a lot of purchasing power, same as the federal government has so much purchasing power and can scale up the new equipment we need and bring down its costs. Amazon is one of the only companies that individually could do that kind of thing as well. All right. Um, well, I mean, it, you've really outlined all this stuff pretty clearly. Like it's, it's really hard for me to like, be like, but I need to know more about that. I mean, I could talk about this for hours. Uh, I, I, I want to know, is there a question you, uh, I, I, you wish I was asking and what's your response to that? I'm not sure. Um, I, I think I covered, that, I covered all of it. I, I got everything that you need that, that you were that, good. All right. Well, I mean, it, it's, it's, a, it's super awesome to have you on here. Uh, you, it's no, it's no uh, mystery to me why you were elected to the uh, Massachusetts legislature. Like you really know your stuff. Um, so I'm really curious to, to, to read more of this book. Um, I encourage everyone to check it out. Um, and I will put links in the show notes for this episode so that people can, can buy it. Um, and is Solomon, is there like a, a contact, um, a contact link or website that you want to direct people to, should they want to contact you about your advocacy or anything like that? Yeah, you can go to solomongr.com. There's a section in there about the book. There's a section with notes on framing and messaging for climate activism. Uh, there's also a section of comics, which is a project I did uh, during the later stages of the campaign, translating the Biden plan into comics with a, a couple of collaborators. Um, yeah. So Sorry, you to told me about that earlier. <laughs> Go ahead. I just. Yeah. I, well, anyone. Anyway, Got it. Okay, everyone, please check that out. Uh, Solomon, if you have a moment, I'd like to like you to stick around to see if we can see questions. Um, but we will be right back.